Ashley, I'm a registered pharmacist. Uh, I'm also a holistic clinical pharmacist and a certified health coach. My journey to holistic medicine actually started in 2002 after a trip to China, which was completely unexpected. Um, and it was sort of a life-changing experience. We studied herbs, uh, drugs, you know, research. Had uh, a moment, I guess, to take a pause and figure out what did I want to do. And I started a business after that and began seeing clients. Uh, and did a lot of homeschooling and researching on my own. So today, I'm here to talk about, I've been asked to talk about, actually, what was in the um, flyer was billed as antioxidants and chemotherapy. And I promise we actually will talk about that tonight. But I thought it would be kind of fun to mix it up a bit more and give you an opportunity to talk to me as a pharmacist about medications as well as the supplements. And what I would like to do is point out some of the sharks in both worlds, in the traditional world and the non-traditional world. And maybe just we'll say we're going to have a focus on safety tonight. How's that sound? So you'll hear some information that I call clinical pearls but also is not so readily available, perhaps, uh, in the medical office or in the literature, or, or said another way, is harder to discern if you're out on the internet trying to figure out what's the truth about my treatment or about the supplements or about you know, this condition in general. So does that sound like a plan? Yeah. That, that's a good one? OK. So here is, in more detail, what I'd like to cover with you. I'm a huge believer, obviously, in the mind-body connection. And so we are going to begin by discussing stress and stress management. Then I'm going to move into the heart, the cardiovascular system. We'll focus a little bit on cholesterol, because many people deal with that. And we'll talk about some of the supplements and foods that are good to lower that. We'll move more into prostate health and specific with some medications. I want to point out, again, some of the side effect profiles. I will talk a bit about hot flashes and a little bit about erectile dysfunction. I want to give you some pretty important information about low T. We'll manage bone health, general nutrition, where I get into the Mediterranean diet. I heard Tom talk about that. And I put it in yellow so you know I will deliver as promised. Antioxidants and chemotherapy, that's a huge controversy. And then we'll end up on memory health. And one more on here which didn't make it to the list is a little bit about medical marijuana. So there's something in there for everyone. Okay? All right, so let's give her a shot. So mind-body connection. We all know that this exists, but rarely do we realize the importance of stress management. So I try to underscore this by saying that the sages, the wise people of the world, of the you know Eastern religions and Eastern traditions have known for you know, centuries that it is really important to meditate. And you don't have to be a transcendental meditator if you remember or you're of that ilk, you know, in the 70s. You can meditate in many different ways. In essence, all you're trying to do is quiet your mind from the noise and the pollution of, you know, life and the world. In 2009, there was a Nobel Peace Prize awarded to a group of scientists that studied the telomere. And the telomere is a sort of like this shoelace tip on the end of a chromosome that protects us and is good. So if you, they found in this research, if one manages one's stress, the telomeres grow and you are protected. So you're protecting your genes. But if you don't, and you just dismiss that, the telomeres shrink. So that's like a direct, objective connection between what you choose to do and how you react to your environment. The mind and body work together. So I do encourage you at your leisure to look up meditation, to look up guided imagery, which is a guided meditation for a sort. Um, I want you to also consider, if you've not heard about it, yeah. We offer that here, guided imagery. Excellent. There you go. So program. you can you can just sign up here. Excellent. Um, and then deep breathing, which is a yoga technique. Do y'all know about deep breathing? So you breathe in a square. I I. We could do this um, later, but we'll, we'll just try to get through the information. If you want to practice, we'll all practice together later. But it's a way to cleanse, again, to focus on the present and just be quiet. All good. All right, next we have cholesterol and cardiovascular health. Many people are challenged in terms of how to handle cholesterol that's been given to them 
genetically or environmentally or by way of lifestyle choices or all of the above. Some medications cause high cholesterol. In men, typically we worry more about the bad or the LDL. In women, we worry or we're thankful for, if you will, the good or the HDL. So there's a little bit of a gender difference in risk. There are many, many, many different foods that lower cholesterol, and here are just a few. When you see the word cassia cinnamon, that is not the same cinnamon that's in the food pantry, by and large. You have to look far and hard, hard for that. More often than not, you'll find that in a supplement form. And there again are also more supplements that are available to lower cholesterol. Red yeast rice is very, very close to the statins, the prescription statins. Not exactly the same, and there's some fascinating history in terms of um, a lawsuit that involved red yeast rice years ago. But let me just say, all of these, and here's my disclaimer, which I'll repeat again. Um, I'm not recommending anything that I talk about tonight for any of you individually, because I have not had the pleasure of getting to know you personally. And so we are simply providing information in an educational format. If you are more interested in some of what you hear tonight, it would be great if you would talk with your physicians about these products or, you know, modalities or all of the above to keep you safe because they're in a position to know your medical and surgical history and know what's absolutely best for you. So red yeast rice is kind of at the top of the supplements in terms of its potency to lower cholesterol. There's another product called niacin, which is not the dose of niacin in a multivitamin, but grams very, very high doses. You do not want to do this without the advice and consent of a physician because it can cause flushing or pain or both. Um, it, does, it has some effects on liver, as does red yeast rice in time, so we have to monitor for that. This niacin is what I call a transition supplement, so it's not a forever choice. Red yeast rice could be, niacin will never be because of the information we know about the liver. Polycostanol is an alcohol, a sterol, and then there's garlic. And garlic and polycostanol don't do such a good job of lowering cholesterol, but they are a bridge. Another couple of options for you to consider. And then finally, in terms of the cardiovascular health, I, I really do need to make mention of the importance of keeping your blood pressure under control. You know, we, again, it's difficult because we don't necessarily know have feelings for or you know, you know signals about blood pressure rising but if we don't manage our stress that's kind of one of the offsets of stress gone awry and increasing your risk of heart attack is not anything that we want so I'm you know I'm really just going to say whether you buy it or not it's found that your bedtime blood pressure is probably more predictive of a morning heart attack and most heart attacks happen between 6 and 8 a.m. Um, so that doesn't mean don't ever monitor your blood pressure during the day. It means take good mind of your blood pressure all the way through the day if that's a risk for you and something that your doctor has got you medicated for. Um, and don't run out of your medicines for sure. Please and thank you. That's a paid political announcement. Okay, so I'm going to vary from the slides a little bit. So the prostate, PSA is sort of the... Um, gold standard blood test. Uh, it's different in benign than it is in cancerous tissue, uh, but it's enlarged in many other, op many other conditions. And I just wanted for fun to put these other conditions down so that you can see it's not a real specific marker. I bet you already know that. And there's free and total and ratios and this and that. There are other tests that can be done that are more, uh, less predictive, a little bit more uh, controversial. We won't get into that tonight. This was more for just uh, a fact of interest, which I thought was fascinating enough to share. So I want to move into some of the um, treatments now. We'll have, again, we'll have a little bit of medications and we'll have a little bit of supplements to talk about. And this particular slide and the discussion is going to be focused on individuals within whom cancer has spread um, to other body parts. Um, or, you know, again, we've been in some other sort of therapy and we're looking for, um, you know, medication that will cause 
the body's androgens or the testosterone-like chemicals to go down. Not to scare you, not to scare you, but rather for interest only, look at the first line, that this category may have some connection with memory loss. We'll just, we'll soften that a little bit. This is a couple years old from the study, but it was a pretty good study. Um, why do they think this? Well, here's the mechanism. So when we have testosterone-like agents in our body or hormones in our body, they aid nerve growth and regeneration. And they help with um, modulating the amyloid plaque. So that's a good thing because Parkinson's, uh, you know, Alzheimer's, other types of dementia oftentimes have an association with a buildup of that plaque. So just be mindful that that information is out there. And like with many things, you know, we're still learning together. This is fairly new information. But I thought it was interesting. It's just interesting, okay? And it increases, the risk increases with the length of therapy. But the benefits of anti-androgen therapy far, far outweigh this risk. Would you not agree? Mm -hmm. That's not to say stop your androgen, anti-androgen therapy. It's to say the benefits far outweigh the risk. There's risks in just everything that we take. Another group of uh, medications now, very quickly, I want to focus on erectile dysfunction. Interestingly, um, there is a place in therapy for any one or all three of these products. Um, Cialis is probably the most well known today because there are more ads on television for it and because it lasts the longest and because it has a dual indication unlike the other two and that's why I'm sharing with you tonight. So you might know a gentleman that's on it daily, a low dose daily for benign prostatic hypertrophy, a brand new indication, but for ED it has a different dose and indication. So the onset for Cialis, Viagra, and Levitra is about the same, okay? 30 minutes or so to two hours, a little bit longer for Viagra, but you can see as far as the duration, Cialis is far and away the one that's the longer lasting, 36 hours as opposed to four to six. Now that may be a good thing, that may not be a good thing. I'm just saying. It is very common after prostate surgery for individuals to be placed back on one of these products because it takes a while for um, the nerves to regenerate or sometimes even if the nerves haven't been damaged in some sort of surgery or procedural technique, um, this is one of the first things that's affected. And so it is important to get kind of back into that with the help of these products. They're very commonly used. Side effects are headache and flushing. The flushing might be of interest to you if you're on an anti-androgen and you already have hot flashes. So it's just one more thing to manage. Again, benefits far outweigh the risk. Um, I'm sure many people in this room know that there is a very important interaction with antihypertensives and with nitrates in specific. And so this would be a discussion with your doctor. You know, how can I manage this? Can I get on other? Uh, anti-anginal or other anti-blood pressure medications if in fact I need to take a product for erectile dysfunction. And again, not to scare you, just think about it as interesting, interesting, interesting. Brand new information that long use with these products may be associated with some type of hearing loss and it has to do with changes in the ear, the cochlea to be exact. Uh, I, it's just fascinating to me how this all comes out, but I have, that's the first time I've ever heard anybody associate that, indicate, that side effect with the indication. Just wanted to make you aware. Now for most men that have had prostate cancer, probably 99% of them, testosterone therapy is not, is contraindicated. Um, but I did want you to know that you heard that come from me. I, I do not agree with testosterone therapy for low, like a, a low number, a low T, low blood T, because it hasn't been FDA approved, it's really not indicated, and in fact it doesn't work that well despite the fact that people think that it does. 
Um, there are many different forms of testosterone. It is actually only FDA approved for hypogonadism, and this is not why most men are using it at all ages. Uh, you can see that there are small benefits for libido, mood, and energy, so why even go there? Because it's a hormone, and you have a hormone-dependent cancer. And we don't know how those two play out. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so while a lot of individuals are taking this for a low number in the blood due to aging, it's not something that I can recommend universally, whether one has prostate cancer or not. And in fact, the FDA says that this product is contraindicated in the prostate cancer population. So if you're an individual that's on low T right now, talk with your doctor, okay? And um, make absolutely sure that this is appropriate for you. All right, we're still on some prescription meds. We'll get through this pretty quickly. The next is um, Exgeva. And I want to talk, it helps me to remind myself to talk about bones and bone density. So when we take, when, when gentlemen have prostate cancer and they're on antiandrogens, a lot of times that will affect the bone density or the bone mass. And so we also worry about metastases, weakening the structure or the strength of the bone. This is a product, um, it, it's actually, uh, there are two indications in two products with the same generic uh, for this. The one I'm talking about is Exgeva. This is a monoclonal antibody. And it is used for gentlemen with prostate cancer that have bone mets. It strengthens the bone. It will lower the calcium that is um, taken away from the bone. It brings it and holds it into the bone, which means your blood level calcium, or your blood calcium level rather, will decrease, and that has to be corrected first. So there's a little bit of issue with calcium levels. Anybody in here, if you could share on this product? Nobody? You, you are? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and they're monitoring your calcium levels? Yes. Excellent. That okay. is vitamin D. Yes. Yeah. We'll talk about D in a minute. So, um, the idea here is that this is a unique mechanism of action. This is very different from the bisphosphonates. Uh, what, what's the controversy and why do I bring this to your attention? If, if you know any women with osteoporosis and you've heard them say, well, I've been, my doctor has told me I need to take Fosamax or Actinel or something that's an injection. Uh, you know, a lot of these products have been associated with jawbone necrosis minimally jawbone necrosis, or a bit of an increased risk of cancer. So there's a lot of fear in the community. Again, I want to bring us towards a benefit far outweighs the risk in most. Same situation here, but even better news, because this is a very novel mechanism of action that is not a bisphosphonate and does not, we think at this point, carry with it the risk of cancer increasing. So that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. It's a good choice. It's one of the newer products, so we're still learning, but it, it, what we know today, anyway, this is a very good choice. When we talk about bone strength in general, there are three different sort of buckets of products. One, the prescription products that we just talked about, and the gentleman Tom alluded to. Two that are the supplements, so now this is kind of my bridge slide to get us moving into the supplements. Calcium has traditionally been sort of the workhorse for bone health um, to prevent or reduce, stave off osteopenia and osteoporosis. In supplement form, typically over the years, women have taken all the way up to 1,200 milligrams of elemental calcium a day, even though much calcium out of the supplement is not absorbed. In fact, only about 25%, we think, is in general. But wouldn't you know, just when you thought you caught up with bills, um, some literature over the last five years, new literature, tells us, for anyone's sake, that it's probably not a good idea to take that much calcium out of the bottle. In fact, we shouldn't exceed 500 milligrams a day. Why is that? Well, in the particular studies that I'm quoting, in postmenopausal women that, who, who were not taking vitamin D, I might add, and uh, took more than 500 milligrams of calcium a day out of the bottle, they had an a little bit of an increased risk of heart attack. 
because you fill up the bone, you fill up the teeth, and the calcium goes where it will, and it decides to go to the heart and deposit in the heart artery. So we don't want that, to avoid that. Yes, we still need a certain amount of calcium each day, men and women, same amount, but all of that but 500 milligrams, or if you can, all of it should be coming from your nutrition, not out of the bottle. Okay? I don't know if you've heard that message, Tom, but that's an important one for you. No, I haven't. In fact, I'm taking 1,200 right now. I would have that conversation with your doctor. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and let me know if you need a copy of the study. Thank to you. To help uh, encourage that Appreciate conversation. It. <laughs> does, it, does it make any difference what kind of no, calcium? No. Calcium is available in many different forms. Citrate, carbonate are the two most common. Um, honestly, it doesn't matter because none of it's well absorbed. It doesn't matter whether it's a chewy, a gummy, a, a chocolate, a tablet, uh, you know, J Japanese something, I don't know what. Oyster shell. Oyster shell, something shell. Uh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't, you know, a lot of people take Tums because it's chewable. Uh, you know, the most important thing about calcium out of the bottle, besides this heart condition or the heart side effect, is the fact that it causes a lot of constipation. It's not, you know, that can be problematic as well. Because of the new news on calcium, it's kind of number two in the hit parade. Number one is now vitamin D. In fact, I should have reversed this. Vitamin D is a hormone. It's a vitamin. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. And it has very fine literature associating a certain blood level with bone strength. When I talked about the bisphosphonates or even... Um, Exegeta, the structure of the bone is never the same as what Mother Nature gave to us when you're taking those meds. It's just like a wraparound, like an insurance policy around the bone sheath. It doesn't change the matrix or the lattice back into what a normal bone structure would be. Did you know that? It's, it's, like a, it's similar to but not exactly the same. So. When we look at um, calcium and D, that really, it, it more interacts with how the bone is built up or destroyed by the, by the cells, with the cells themselves. It's a different mechanism of action. But D, nonetheless, has, of all the indications that vitamin D has been talked about over the years, and you've probably got some of the examples on your slides, bone strength is the only one that I'm confident in recommending is a cause and effect. So if you Go to the doctor and get a blood level for your vitamin D, and it's a certain value or within a certain range. You can be confident that you are protecting your bones with the particular dose that you have. Remembering that it's fat soluble, you can also be confident that you can get toxic on this, and nobody talks about that. It doesn't make a bit of difference in the lower levels of toxicity, which would be patterned after a blood level, not necessarily the dose that you're taking, because <coughs> no two people are on the same amount of vitamin D. But in essence, it's really more to do with when you're kind of over the edge in toxicity over time, it'll affect your kidneys, and that's one other thing that we don't want to be doing. So I'm here to, now I am trying to make you a little bit afraid. See, I'll tell you when you don't have to worry, and I'll tell you when you don't have to worry. So we're not going to do any meditating right now. Vitamin D is, is it is not a magic bullet, guys. It's just one of the other fads that come and go about every six months to two or three years. Maybe it has an impact on depression. Maybe it has some impact on diabetes. Maybe it has some impact on cancer. But it's a hormone. You have a hormone-dependent disease. You can get too much. Okay? So please hear that message over and over again. Yeah. Go ahead. We've heard about sunshine, though. If you live in Florida, you have more vitamin D. Than you do. Here under the clouds, so how do you factor that? Well, if you expose most of your uh, exposed body parts to the sun for about 15 minutes a day, you get more than 10,000, which you won't tox out on from the sun, interestingly. You can out of the bottle. Do you see a recurrent theme here? Um, and that's, for most people, enough. Of course, you know, if you're using sunscreen, it may be a little bit different. Um, I am a big proponent of getting a blood level. It's a, a, the test is covered by insurance. It's easy to do. You can add it on to an annual visit. 
Um, it is not a routine test, so you do have to ask for that. Yeah. But if you get a bun up on January when it's cloudy around here, and then now, now it's uh, hot and muggy and sunny, maybe July, August, September, isn't that level going to be nowhere close? You can to check. Day? You can check. It might not be different. You'd be surprised. It might not be different. Oh. But there's no reason to make assumptions. Just go get it done, and then you can determine what your test, your your blood. Um, your blood level is as well as the dose. And let me just say one more thing, please. So the Institute of Medicine now recommends, for most of us, about 800 international units of vitamin D3 a day. That's a whole lot different than 10,000, 50,000, 100,000. If you're on one of those higher doses, that's not a forever dose. In fact, let's get to the root cause of why your D is so low. Let's have that conversation. And it's not just because you're not in the sun. There are other reasons why. Absorption could be down. Your kidneys may not be uh, metabolizing to the active form. The liver might not be releasing. All of the above. Sir, you had what it. are they called the tests that you're speaking It's 25-OH vitamin D. It should be on your handout. 25-OH vitamin D. And that is a blood test. They, they wouldn't pay the blood. On my annual physical, I have to work. They wouldn't pay the Really? I don't know why I'm really surprised by that. Most, most insurance companies that I'm aware of do. Well, I've had it paid for in the past. I'm just saying, I would feel. So that then moves me into now diet and nutrition. So we've, we've kind of gone from prescriptions into supplements a little bit. Now we're moving further into nutrition because that's the building block that I'm going to leave you with tonight. So the Mediterranean diet for me, is the world's gold standard on healthy eating. And I'm often, often, often asked, what kind of diet should I be on? Whether you wish to lose weight, or you are diabetic, or you are gluten intolerant, or you are, um, you know, just trying to optimize your health with antioxidants, because, you know, and anti-inflammatories are all of the above, with the exception of possibly gluten, because there is wheat in this diet. You can see that there are strategies, there are strategies here that are different from what we typically hear about in the public domain, which are, for example, for high blood pressure, the DASH diet or the no salt diet, the low glycemic index diet for diabetics, the low cholesterol foods and diet, or the, you know, we intolerance, celiac slash gluten free diet. All of those have their place. But you can just go crazy trying to kick up with which one is the best and are you trying to mix and match and now you know what do I do so let me teach you some principles tonight and then you pick you pick what's best for you how's that so in light of the Mediterranean diet I see four big buckets here the first one is an antioxidant bucket so you know basically people are looking for um, Colorful fruits and vegetables, if they're in their natural state, the best. But if they're frozen or they're cooked, that's okay too. You know, just be mindful that you're, you don't have to stress out on what your, you know, the form of food that you're eating, but just look for the types of foods that I'm teaching you about. Red wine is allowed, red grapes are allowed, but guess what? The resveratrol, which everybody talks about, which is the antioxidant that's very healthy is only found in the seeds and the skin of red grapes or red wine that's made with seeds or <coughs> you have to talk about your wine uh, connoisseur to find out how it was manufactured, but you, you can do that. So antioxidants are very powerful and yes, I believe in them for stress, for longevity, for you know prevention of chronic illness and all of the above. The problem is we don't have any doses and that's why everybody's kind of hard to believe not wanting to do the foods because they think a lot of things and wanting to jam on supplements so that they can be sure that they have that insurance policy and they've got enough. Well, I'm here to tell you that enough is probably too much right out of the bottle uh, and I can go on and on and on. So you've got to bear with me and see that there's wisdom in doing what I'm asking you to consider out of the diet, the nutrition, not, yes. Are you saying with red grapes we have to eat the get, get seeded grapes and eat the whole thing? Is skin. You have to get the skin. Can you puree it or something or mix it up and drink it? Yeah, I can do that. Too? Sure. Yeah. The next big bucket is anti-inflammatory. So this is typically a category that includes the oils, <laughs> liquid oils. So you have monounsaturated or polyunsaturated. And the two best examples there would be olive oil 
and would be fish oil or omega-3. Okay? And the two go hand in hand. So health is positively impacted by both antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. They work hand in hand towards um, general health, towards uh, managing an illness like what you're managing, um, and beyond, actually. Protein is a partner within the antioxidant bucket. So now this is bucket number three. Your immune system needs to have enough protein and enough antioxidants to optimize. And you know most of your immune system is in your gut. So if you're not eating properly, with that is to say whole foods, within certain categories, your immune system will be not optimal. Why is that important? Well, if you've undergone surgery and or you're still undergoing radiation or maybe other treatments, your body's under stress, you're under attack. And that right out of the gate means that your immune system hears that message and needs to fight a little bit harder. We're coming into the flu season. You know, if you've got on top of that the flu or a cold or something, your body is still trying to fix that problem on top of everything else, it's tough. As we age, our immune system is less strong also. So these things can be all put into, lumped into a category of, I can go to eating more antioxidants and making sure I get enough protein in my diet to build up my immune system. Now notice I didn't say run out and buy prooxidants, run out and buy probiotics, rather, run out and buy, um, I don't know, uh, well, I'll show you a list in just a minute. So hang on to your question, Tom. Um, I want to share with you, though, that you can also eat too much protein. So you don't want to be, I'm not a favor of, for example, of the Atkins diet, which is protein, 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 because then that burns out your kidneys. So nothing in the extreme is ever going to be healthy, whether it's out of the bottle or in your foods. Nothing, nothing, nothing. In time, you'll pay the price. The other category, very quickly, is it's interesting to me that the Mediterranean diet does not have a lot of dairy intake, but the assumption is you're getting enough calcium in your diet, and that would be coming from vegetables, which is hard to do. This is probably the one thing that I don't agree with. But many people say, oh, there's too much mucus in milk, or I don't like cow's milk, or I'm worried about the hormones in cow's milk, or the antibiotics, well, then you can go organic, or you can do almond milk. So almond milk is fortified water. That's a fortified food. That's not, almonds aren't high and rich in calcium. Did you know that? That's, that's artificial fortification. But apparently it's better than taking it out of the bottle. So many people have switched from cow's milk, because they don't tolerate it or don't enjoy it, to almond milk for the calcium content. Much, much more calcium in almond milk than in cow's milk, skim milk, but much less protein. So it's a balance. If you're going to go that route, again, making sure that you get enough protein in your diet. Okay, Tom, go ahead. What about eggs? Eggs are fine. I don't care. I don't even care about the yolks. They come in and out of, you know, favor. It's it's good protein. They're very good protein. Well, uh, I need to ask all the questions, but well, I then why don't you just hold it till the end? Can you can you can oh, you hold? Yeah, all right. All right. I just uh, some doctors and nurses. Say I uh, don't eat grains much because they cause a the sugar spike. So I stopped eating those things and I, I lost weight. Excellent. And I feel better. Now. There are other grain substitutes too. Um, you know, it makes me think about, um, gosh, I don't know, quinoa. Do you all know what quinoa is? Mm -hmm. um, that's a seed, but it is proteinaceous. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of a carb too, but it's better than eating pasta, for example. Oh. Or, for example, also, if you do enjoy pasta, you can find those that are more protein rich. Uh, again, if you are eating carbs and you have protein sort of as the chaser, that's a good thing because it'll help you metabolize a, bit, uh, a lot better. Okay. All right, so now let's move into, yes, go ahead. You say you get too much protein. Are you familiar with this whey protein and the, the powder that you can buy? Sure, and the whey protein powders or any kind of protein powders are fine as long as you don't exceed the label. And that's where people get into problems. So if it says one scoop, it means one scoop. Just overload the kidney. And yeah. 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 Scoop. Oh. If, if I if I tolerate, uh, like I drink two percent milk, should I 
uh, go to Almond? Or should I just stay with what I got as long as it's working? There's no reason to not drink cow's milk other than you might want to think about organic because you have a hormone dependent cancer. And again, I, I'm talking about foods, whether they be milk or chicken or other food products where you know they're using a lot of antibiotics and hormones to just ramp them up and get them to market, mostly in that category. Okay. Um, I think it would be wise to spend, if you're able, to spend the extra money and do organic. Okay, thank you. Okay, B vitamins. Um, very important for functioning of the nervous system. They give us energy. They help wrap around the myelin sheath on nerves. So those are all good things. But like anything else, again, it's amazing to me, and this is only out of the bottle. Uh, B6, actually, and folic acid mostly, have been associated with an increased risk of cancer, and in fact, prostate cancer. So here's the deal. If you're taking B supplements, like a lot of people will have, um, will take B complex 50 or B complex 100, which is a very common uh, combination that's on the shelf for energy. Or they're trying to get the B12 and it's kind of hidden in the list, okay? Because they think they're low in B12 or in fact they've been shown to be low in B12. Understand that there are certain doses, and, and in fact, the probably the best way for me to summarize what I'm about to say is to give you a generic example. And this is only anecdotal, this is not scientific. In my humble professional experience over, let's just say, several decades, it's interesting to me that the body doesn't recognize drugs as fuel, but it recognizes nutrition or whole foods as fuel. Meaning we can achieve the same goals in both different categories, okay, for health. But in one instance, it's, it's almost like there's perfection there. And in the other instance, we have nothing but problems and side effects in time. Now, is it because our drug companies aren't smart, Mr. Uh, Mary Merrill Dow? No. It's because the plants in nature are perfect. And if you look at all the different constituents in a leaf, it's amazing to me how similar they are. They all have fiber. They all have water, most of them. They all have antioxidants, the same antioxidants, many of which are phytoestrogens. They all have vitamins and minerals. <coughs> Isn't that amazing? And for some odd reason, probably because our maker and our creator knew more than we did, that's the magic bullet, guys. It's not the drugs that we produce, which is typically one chemical pushed to an extreme dose, which doesn't work throughout the whole body. It works on the condition that's been studied or the organ system or that moment in time in your entire metabolic process. And if you believe in the whole person and the whole body absorbing and, and reacting, it makes perfect sense to me that we've got it all wrong. So why as a country, as a nation, are we continually trying to act more like, you know, and take more drugs, supplements, which is going farther away from mother nature and perfection? Just something to think about. Well, that's, excuse me, that's exactly what I'm telling you here. B vitamins in foods don't cause that, for the most part, it's coming out of the bottle. There's a magic cutoff on folic acid that's 400 mics. Most of the studies that I'm quoting here were higher than that. But when you're looking for B-complex 50 or B-complex 100, and you see the term, each serving has 1,000% of RDI, 3,000% of RDI. In this category, that should bother you. And it's very easy to find. Not safe, yeah. Uh, the urology group put out a uh brochure, so a small little uh, booklet about prostate cancer. And at the end, at the very back of it, it talks about certain supplements, vitamins and supplements that you may want to avoid. You Is this on avoid. there? Yes. B vitamins, especially. Right. I commend them, whoever B12, that is. B, uh, B6. B6 and probably yeah. the two yeah. most probably. Yeah. So my question is, is there enough of those B vitamins in just like a one-a-day vitamin? That sure. Uh, and again, you don't have to. It? I mean, you're, a vitamin is is not. I'll talk about that in a minute. That's not the be-all yeah. end-all either. It's your food. It's your whole food. 
Right, but can you take, if you have prostate cancer, can you still take a, B, uh, a one a day? Vitamin? As long as there's not more Safe. than 100 to 200 percent of RDI. It, and it, they're all different now. Yeah. They're, they're all so different. It's so hard to generalize. But I typically look for 100 to 200 percent of anything. Okay. And if there's uh, more than that, then we, we have a problem. You see 500 percent of. Don't do it. The, yeah. And, I'm, and I'm, again, I'm pretty sure that the B complexes are all, in essence, 300 percent, 500 percent, 1,000, 5,000, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was surprised to see that. I don't know who wrote it. Boy, tell, give them my hats off and uh, my business card because that's that's yeah. pretty For them, impressive. Yeah. yeah. Which foods would be high in B vitamins? Mostly fortified cereals. What would be plan B other than fortified cereals? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, fruits and vegetables are always going to be good. I don't eat any meat or, or I just do vegetables and my vitamin B12 is right in the middle where it should be. You're doing this good one job. one doctor was giving me 5,000 and I heard that it could cause prostate cancer and I put that right away. All right, we're going to kind of mix and match here. I think I'm going to leave that one to go. I want to keep going here so you guys can have time to ask me other questions. So what are some other vitamin changes with age? Well, we've talked about both of these thus far, but I want to remind you that these are both blood tests that are easily performed, typically covered again by insurance, need to be done maybe once a year just to be on the safe side. Will be a request maybe from your physicians, not an automatic. Okay, and there's certain reasons why it's important to get your blood done because many doctors will just say, well, go out and get B12 or go out and get a D. And there's no real objective criteria to give you a real individualized dose. I hate that. I think we have to be more judicious about being personalized and make sure that we've got a cause and effect relationship there. Because everything out of the bottle, guys, in time becomes toxic. I mean, it just will. You, you have to take my word for it. I mean, I've spent 15 years looking at this, and I, I truly believe that. Could you take just a second to talk about the controversy of cancer prevention with vitamin D? On the previous slide, you've got this. Yeah, I can, sure. Um, so, when. You look at the literature, there's a lot of other research that's going on with vitamin D outside of the bones. That's very good. Because it's a hormone, it is, for example, very interesting to me that if you had high cholesterol and you, the doctor ordered you to be on a statin, and you developed um, muscle aches or muscle damage, um, it's typically because the statins deplete vitamin D, but it's also because in lowering cholesterol, Cholesterol is a precursor to vitamin D, so you're almost always going to have low D. And there's a lot more going on. And cholesterol is all over the body. I mean, it's a hormone that's ubiquitous with regard to the male-female hormones. And so there, the D is in the lineup, if you will, of all of the, um, uh, you know, those types of hormones. So while that's all said, there has been a lot of literature and press on um, depression. But when you start trying to connect the dots with D doses out of the bottle and such things as diabetes, or even depression for that matter, there's no well-designed clinical studies that have been done in individuals with depression where all the other variables have been you know, eliminated and the dose has <coughs> been consistent and the product quality has been consistent and you know what you're dealing with. So you've heard me say a couple times tonight, don't just pick a dose out of the air. In these other controversies, we can say maybe in animals, vitamin D prevents some kinds of cancer, but not all. But it's not really been well-designed studies in humans. Or any of these for prevention. I mean, you'll hear a lot of people talking about antioxidants. D is also an antioxidant. Jam on the bottled supplement antioxidants for cancer prevention. Well, that's, what's the dose? What's the outcome? What's the end point? I don't know how to say over a lifetime, which typically takes 20 to 30 years to analyze in an epidemiologic study, that you 
actually impacted a disease or condition by taking something to prevent it. So when you start picking through the literature and picking through the logic, it doesn't make sense. But what does make sense right now is that we're on a path of learning more about vitamin D, that hormone. We're going to probably at some point have more information on a connection between some of these conditions in a preventive mode. And we'll be able to speak to the dose so that we don't get toxic. But you're always going to be able to get vitamin D in fortified foods, which you don't have to worry about necessarily all the side effects that we're talking about out of the bottle. And nutrition the best that you can. So does that help a little bit? Sure. It's just an unknown. So it's, for me, a question mark stuff. Great start, but we're not there yet. I have a question on vitamin D in the blood test. Yeah. What's your level? What would you say your safe level? 40. No higher than 40? No higher than 40. 40 to 45. And there are a lot of people that have very high D levels. And it is something that, that can become toxic over time. You can actually get too much, yeah. Yeah, because I was thinking the same thing, because I take about a thousand. And I can't comment on anybody's one dose. I can give you two points of reference. Once again, the Institute of Medicine says 800 international units a day. And, and if you get a blood test and your blood test comes back anything close to 30 to 40, you're good. If it's lower than that, you're going to need to talk to your doctor. If it's higher than that, you're going to need to talk to your doctor. Okay. So you've got two points of reference. Sure. Okay. All right, multiple vitamins. Uh, they really have neither helped or hindered pretty much any disease state. This was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a while back, uh, a couple of years ago now. But it is amazing to me that it is, again, a very hard sell in a country where all we see is, you know, supplements, supplements, supplements. I'm just going to go grab off the shelf all these insurance policies. And I know that it's better because I can't get enough in my food. The soil is horrible. I won't want. I don't want the pests. I mean, I've heard of all. I've heard of all. You know, why, why, why? You've got to try it. Just don't take my word for it. Why don't you try some of these strategies or principles that I'm teaching you in your diet and see if it doesn't in fact help you make, make you feel better? It certainly is going to be a lot less expensive because supplements are are tough. But, you know, it's really important for you to hear that it's not harmful to take a multivitamin if you take it within reason. So what's within reason? What did we just talk about? 100 to 200%. Yes. Yes. And I could go down the list with other vitamins in that panel of ingredients in multi and tell you why it's important to stay low. <coughs> Less is more when it comes to supplements and vitamins. How Thank about, um, Oh, go ahead. I was, I was going to ask, because you don't hear a lot about it so much anymore, you did a lot, but for arthritis and for joints, your joints and stuff, what about glucosamine and chondroitin? Sure. I'm going to ask you to park that and bring that up in open discussion at the end. Okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep moving. Let me get through this, guys, and then you can have as much time as you need to ask me your questions. Okay, I think you. Do, do you think it makes any difference what the form of the vitamins? No. Whether they're no. synthetic no. laboratory, no cofactors, or whether they're in a food state form? No. Most things are semi-synthetic by the time they get in the bottle, regardless of how they start. Food is probably going to be better. To, let me modify that. Food is probably going to always be better if it's not overcooked and, you know, bulk off. If it's grown well and you're consuming as best you can the original form, that's the best of all. Always the best of all. Okay. Um, brand new information, and, and here's an opportunity. Now this is tough, so just hang with me. I'm going to interpret a study with you, and I'm going to show you how to be skeptical. So this is pretty impressive because it comes from the National Cancer Institute this year. Brand new information. And it has to do with fish oil and a risk, or not, with uh, prostate cancer. So here we are. Um, in this study, there were about 800 men with prostate cancer and about 1,300 men without. This is from the SELECT trial. So this is a carve-out of a bigger trial, and they call that an ad hoc analysis. It's not the reason why this trial was designed. 
it's kind of an interesting side find. You can always sort the data 17 ways to Sunday and make it say what you want it to say or try to find something that's interesting. But that's not quality research. That's secondary tier. So it's important that you hear that message. And because of that, because of how it was set up, you need to position what I'm about to tell you here. That high doses of omega-3 fish oil increased risk of all types of prostate cancer, whether it was mild or serious in this population. And it actually corroborated a, re a really well-designed European study from a few years earlier. To give you more background, the SELECT trial, some of you may have even known about this because it was conducted in Cincinnati and around the country, was a 12-year, set up originally as a 12-year study looking at the risk of prostate cancer in two different groups. So group one had, and they were antioxidant groups, interestingly. Group one had selenium, which is an antioxidant metal. 200 mics daily, and group two had vitamin E, 400 international units daily, another antioxidant. And there might have been another group that had both. I, I can't really remember. So that was the trial over 12 years. They stopped it early because selenium didn't make a difference in risk of prostate cancer, and vitamin E increased the risk. So there's another example of many where <clears throat> antioxidants out of the bottle have side effects, even though you're taking them for the right reasons for general health. So now, there was also another subset of the select group that was looking at risk of Alzheimer's disease, but I'm not sure how that panned out. I don't think there was any improvement uh, from these two vitamins either, or supplements either. Uh, carve out, and the second carve out was the risk of cancer. Again, a very interesting find. It's, it's a study that sort of went south, and if you're a researcher in the room, you understand that if, you're, if you've just spent millions on your study and it was stopped early because the outcome went south, you just lost a lot of money because <laughs> you were hoping to market those products, however, and for whatever. So you got to find something to make to justify your time. I'm not saying that it was wrong to do so, but I'm just saying you look long enough from an epidemiological perspective and you're going to find something somewhere. But it does give me an opportunity to tell you again, if you're taking too much of these products out of the bottle, it's not like taking them or eating them in food. There's Brazil nuts that have selenium and people aren't getting cancer from Brazil nuts. Vitamin E, however, has come in and out of the literature because of an increased risk of death and heart attacks long before this was done. So this is now connecting the dots, study to study, seeing a trend and a pattern. And over time, we learn more and more supplements, higher and higher doses, are not safe. Do you see a pattern? Do you see where I'm going? <coughs> yes. Yeah, now our guru, uh, Dr. Myers, uh, <coughs> he says that you know, taking these to omega-3 fish oil is very good. They are very good. Hear the message. High doses, high blood levels. Specifically, I'm going to, uh, I guess I can do this now. There's two acids in omega-3 fish oil that you're really buying. Did you know that? Yes. They are, these two, and it was the high DHA. In, in fish oil, there are different ratios of those two acids. And in fact, there's a third in some called ALA, which we don't metabolize into these two. ALA is found in flaxseed, it's found in walnuts. But it's called omega-3, and oftentimes on the label, other omega-3. There is um, probably a general recommendation in the public domain right now that you should not exceed a total of 500 milligrams a day of these two. We're speaking of much, much higher. Where is that a problem? In the prescription arena, there's a product called Lovaza. It is 84% pure DHA and EPA. You can't get that on the over-the-counter market anywhere. It is used for hypertriglyceridemia. So that's people with humongously high triglyceride levels, probably genetic. That's the population that I would be concerned about with studies like this. But again, this is 
tempting to, you know, grab onto with a result like that and say, oh my God, I, gotta get, I can't ever take fish oil. But you said that this study was not necessarily done for DHA and EPA. That so is, it was not done to look at cancer risk. It was not an epidemiologic these study. These people were given very high doses of this That's DHA That's correct. Do you know what the dosage was? I do not. But I can tell you it was a lot higher than 500. So what I'm teaching you here on this slide is to be skeptical. Get a learned intermediary to help you interpret studies, don't just, and it's so hard to do this, but when you hear sensationalized results on the news or in the, you know, on the internet or you... Uh, right, but that's Fred Hutchinson's study has also been criticized by other researchers who say it was flawed. <coughs> I'm saying yeah. the same thing. No, that this study which I'm says, saying the same thing. This result was a cherry pick out of a study that was not set up to look for this. It's okay, so just an ad hoc clear. analysis. So other studies have shown that taking fish oil is good for you. So good for you in what sense? Well, that it reduces your risk of prostate cancer or, or reduces the chance that your prostate cancer will proliferate. Yeah. So it's a very complex discussion at right. best. So that's what you should be telling us. It's not that you pointed this out, you didn't say the other thing. I, I haven't gotten there yet, Sarah, with okay. all due respect. All right. So, when we, I'm going to go back to the discussion for the Mediterranean diet. Let's pick up some strategy and just pull it through again one more time. So the principles we just learned in the Mediterranean diet were that antioxidant foods are good, anti-inflammatory foods are good, they work together hand in hand, right? Everybody there? Yeah. But that if we try to do the same thing out of the bottle, we have problems. That gets into the doses and the side effects. We don't seem to find that in the foods. In the anti-inflammatory principle discussion, omega-3 is one of the best. One of the best anti-inflammatories. I said olive oil is one of the best anti-inflammatories. One's a monounsaturated fatty acid, the other is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. The brain contains a lot of omega-3. It likes DHA. EPA is an anti-platelet kind of a, an acid, together they go hand in hand. Um, it's found in the nerves, it's a neurotransmitter. This is something that's very good. Most people are trying their best to get some kind of anti-inflammatory food or supplement in their diet, and I commend them. I'm not against that. It's the dose. Do not exceed, unless your doctor for whatever reason tells you otherwise, 500 milligrams of DHA and EPA per day out of the bottle. Fish oil. It is not flaxseed. Flaxseed does not include, it does not contain rather DHA and EPA. It, it, flaxseed has ALA. Walnuts do not have DHA and EPA. They have ALA. We do not metabolize ALA. It's, it's, it's pointless. Uh, pointless. Um, I had another thought, so hang on. Um, so, how to buy a high quality fish oil. This is probably a pretty important discussion for those of you who wish to use fish oil because most of the products on the market are junk. If you look on the label, I didn't bring one tonight, but if you look on the front of a bottle of fish oil, it'll say, for example, 1,000 milligrams. Okay? You turn it over and you look at the nutritional facts, and it'll say, per serving, so many milligrams of thus and such, so many milligrams of DHA and EPA. There should be at least 50% of that 1,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA or 500 milligrams to even come close to being a good quality product. And that's not the best, but that's about what you're going to find on the shelf. And that is the recommended daily general health dose out of the bottle to answer your question for safe keeping. I am not going to comment on prostate cancer prevention. I'm just so, going to say general health. But you can do the same thing, again, out of your nutritional plan. You can try to intake more olive oil, which would be perhaps a tablespoon a day, something like that. Actually, the Mediterranean diet is, is perhaps more than that. But, you know, I'm just trying to keep you safe. Um, you can eat salmon, sardines, light canned tuna. You want to limit those portions to maybe a couple a week. 
Some people are concerned about mercury content. I get it. It's a personal choice. Um, you know, olive oil and omega-3 are kind of neck and neck as far as their health value. <coughs> as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter. What does matter to me is that if you're going to do fish oil out of the bottle, that you choose a high-quality product. You, you know how to buy that based on two factors. One, these are the only things that matter on that entire label, these two acids. That's the active, those are the active ingredients rather in omega-3. And that there's at least 50% of that whole dose, whatever that is, 1,000 milligrams, 1,200 milligrams, and that is different than a serving. Why do I say that? Serving could be too tight. Yes. So you can see it's kind of hard to purchase. So I'm curious, if you feel like you've gotten fish oil that you think is high quality, is this new information or not new information for you? Well, I, I think the only thing that makes this uh, uh, extremely relevant is that, you know, omega-3 fish oils, you hear about them a very small percent for prostate cancer, for heart disease. I mean, that's, you know, boom, everywhere you go with no. heart disease is omega-3. I know what I was going to say. Now, to make it even more fun for you, just when you think you got it, there's different ratios of these in a lot of the products, and there's no magic formula there. So when you take it to the final step and you look at the various literature that's out there, it's all different. Some of them are just EPA, high doses. Others are a combination that they're not the same ratio from study to study, so you can't do a horizontal review. You know what the ratio is of fish? Of fish? Oh, in man. fish? Yes. Yeah, now hang on. Just hang with me a minute. So bumblebee tuna, I called them one time. And I asked how much omega-3 is in each serving. And they told me that, and it's going to come to me probably after I go home. Um, it's still not a lot. It's still not a lot. But it's better than, or no, it was sardines, begging your pardon. It was a can of sardines. And it took me a hard time, a long time to get that information. I can't remember. But it's not, I'm sure it wasn't more than 500 milligrams, but it wasn't that. No, I mean the ratio of DHA to EPA. I did not get that. Now, you can take it one step further, and you might enjoy this with your background. You can ask for a certificate of analysis. I believe they have that for food. They do have it for supplements. So this is a really hard supplement to buy, isn't it, when you stop to think about all the factors that go into a purchase. Right. Yeah. Are there any nuts that have DHA and EPA? Um, well, ALA, typically. So that would be your walnuts. Okay, but so I get walnuts won't work for that if there's nothing else. Nor flaxseed. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, omega-3 does not lower cholesterol. It lowers triglycerides in very high doses. Okay, so quickly, here are the foods. How much time do I have? Till 9 o'clock. So is it till 9, seriously? Yeah. Okay. Very good. So here are the foods that are high in antioxidant value. They're on your slide, so I'm not going to spend time. I will mention, though, green tea. It's an excellent antioxidant. It also has a relaxing chemical in there, which is called L-theanine. If you buy decaffeinated, you can use that for sleep. Um, here are the supplements that are problematic. So now I'm moving into what I promised tonight, which is probably why you came, to talk a little bit more specifically about antioxidants and chemotherapy. So this, friends, is the list of supplement antioxidants that, that are the no-nos. Okay? And when you see these, some of them you'll recognize, I bet you, right away, but others you may not. Uh, such things as soy, isoflavones, which are phytoestrogens. Uh, I don't know. Melatonin is an antioxidant. It's used for sleep. Quercetin is an antioxidant. Coenzyme Q10 is an antioxidant. Lycopene, lutein. Um, there are many different categories. I could go on and on. Vitamin A and so on. Those are the ones we're talking about when I begin now the section on antioxidants and some chemotherapy and radiation being contraindicated. Not the foods, just the bottled supplements. 
So here's the background. And instead of spending the whole night, I'm just going to give it to you in about five minutes. Antioxidants get rid of or work against reactive oxygen species, which many people say, you know, those are the bad things floating around in our bodies. Well, that's part, those are part of the metabolic processes, and it's my opinion that reactive oxygen species are necessary for life. And the only problem that you hear about that really is worthy of discussion is when they become excessive for whatever reason. So stress, you know, environment, accumulation of lifestyle decisions, all of the above. They depend on energy. There are certain cancer, uh, I'm sorry, certain chemotherapy agents and all radiation which depend on energy to create cell death. And that type of energy dependent cell death is called apoptosis. Have you ever heard that word before? Different from necrosis. Necrosis, remember, N, no, not energy dependent. Apoptosis, yes, energy dependent dependent upon those reactive oxygen species to get the job done. So I have to have the bad guys, if you will, ROS, reactive oxygen species, for the radiation to do its job on the cancer. I have to have the bad guys, ROS, for some chemotherapy, there it is, to kill the cancer cells that are energy dependent. Okay? If I'm taking too many antioxidants out of the bottle, there's no ROS left. There's no bad guys left. So the chemotherapy says, well, thanks very much, you know. How am I supposed to do my job? Radiation, you might say, well, goodness, you're telling me that this little supplement, this little vitamin A or this little vitamin C out of the bottle has as much impact on my body as, like, all these treatments, all these various courses of radiation have. Well, probably not, but who knows? I mean, it hasn't been well studied. There is controversy all over the place with this particular notion of an interaction with antioxidants out of the bottle and certain types of chemotherapy that have a mechanism that's dependent upon the very things that you're taking the antioxidants to avoid. So you have three choices. Well, one is to not take any antioxidants as supplements, which wouldn't make me upset. You can probably guess, okay? Or to just keep on keeping on because you're taking them for immune health, so you think. And the gorilla radiation or the gorilla chemotherapy in your mind far outweighs the strength of those two, the power of those two, or, or one, far outweighs what you think is going on in the bottle or to sort of do a more middle-of-the-road approach, which is a mix and match. So not so much for your type of cancer and chemotherapy, because most of you won't have that. But for others, you know, it's, it may be more meaningful to say you can sort of do an on-off approach, where if you're having a cycle of chemo, you don't do the antioxidants out of the bottle, and if you're on your off weeks, you can. But I'm telling you, more important than any of that. If you didn't even have cancer, I would say, why are you even doing that? Because of the evidence that I've shared with you tonight in terms of side effects, in terms of the study that said multivitamins that had antioxidants in them made no difference, positive or negative, on the outcome of cancer, heart protection, and longevity. And the fact that we all need more nutrition to build what? Protein and antioxidant foods build what? The immune system. Do you see how you can sort of logically create a scenario that leads us back to a very basic decision, a very foundational decision, which is whole foods of certain categories for certain intentional reasons that will get you to your goal much safer, much cleaner, much healthier in a sustainable way over years. I mean, these are lifetime decisions, guys, that help your entire family as opposed to trying your best to get something going on in the bottle. I mean, I've, I'm happy to help you with that, and I've done so over the years. But I feel the more and more I see and learn, we're not serving our communities well if we teach that out of the bottle is, is the approach and, and the magic bullet. That bullet's coming right back around to us, I think, as a, as a country. 
So this is a slide to circle. If you are interested, uh, probably nothing on here from most of you would uh, impact uh, you personally other than the radiation. Here's the slide of the OK. So this is the list of products that are used in treatments, many different kinds of cancers, not just yours which are probably not impacted by antioxidants out of the bottle, and you'll see some, some familiar faces, such as Lupron, Cazadex, Ulexin. Um, we do have a prostate cancer vaccine now. You'll see Dotaxel, Do, Docetaxel, which is new um, for prostate cancer, um, second tier. Uh, so the hormones, the biologics, the MADs, the monoclonal antibodies, and one of the, the vaccine, and then potentially the taxines are okay. Um, you know, this is again not something, I, I presented a lot of controversy tonight, and this is the world that we live in, in medicine. You realize there's no, there's no clean, there's very little black and white. Very little black and white when you get into the weeds on supplements. Um, and so I do feel that it's important to, to, to share this information. Um, I really don't want to spend a lot of time on memory other than to say, look at this. You might want to circle this slide. When people, again, are coming to me, okay, what supplement should I be taking to improve my memory? First of all, you better figure out what you're dealing with because there are many different types of memory loss. There are many different types of dementia. Alzheimer's is different than a ischemic dementia. Um, it might be situational. In fact, all of these things are reversible and you could have one or more of these situations going on and in fact that's round number one where we need to go to understand the root cause of your situation as opposed to slapping a label on it and boom we're going off to you know get four and five supplements that may or may not work for a year or two or three, and in fact, could have side effects. So, because I think this is probably close to the, the most frequent question I get asked these days over the antioxidants, I brought it for you. But I really don't want to talk about that because um, I really want to talk about medical marijuana, and I guess I didn't leave a slide for this. Let me just say one thing about Ginkgo, and then we'll talk about marijuana, and we'll, we'll open it up here. So it doesn't, it might work, it might not work, I don't know. You know, this is one that's been all over the place for decades, and it has a vascular, sort of a mechanism of action. It probably works on both arteries and veins, that's good. It probably works in the head, as well as the peripheral vasculature, that's good. Um, the problem is, like with fish oil, it's very hard to buy a high quality ginkgo. You have to have a standardized product, and it's two categories of chemicals. So you're going to look for a USP certified, it's hard to find. There are some side effects to concern yourself with, one of which, importantly, is bleeding and bruising. I did talk a lot about side effects and drug interactions with all these supplements together, but it's an issue, and your pharmacist can help you. But. Um, there's a lot of contaminated product floating around. Here's, here's some information from Consumer Report. These aren't the only ones I just brought in. Um, interacts with NSAIDs, so your Celebrex, Motrin, Aleve category, um, and still increased risk of bleeding. Coumadin, um, you know, you need to start revering supplements that, like drugs and understanding they all have side effects and interactions. They need to be managed by your pharmacist or doctor or both. Um, we're in a position to help you, keep you safe, um, and maximize the treatment that you're getting for your prostate cancer. So that's just my take home message. Um, medical marijuana, you probably have heard um, our uh, governor Kasich signed a bill in June of this year, right after he stepped off the campaign trail. Legalizing medical marijuana in the state of Ohio, we have become the 25th state now to do so. Um, there is um, a phase-in period of time over the next year or two before this is fully implemented, but as of, I think, Thursday of next week, it's official, so I'm sure that people are going to try to start sourcing it if they haven't already. Um, there are 21 indications that have been approved. 
It does include cancer. Uh, it does include chronic pain. Um, it is a state bill and a state approval or legalization. It is not a federal approval. So it is federally still a Schedule One product, which means it has no medical value and, in fact, is, is not safe. Um, we are also uh, the recipient, I believe, of a very uh, another you know part of the bill that, that will be good in that um, it did not include smoking, it does include vaping, uh, and any other wrapped. So pretty much, bedibles and vaping are the big you know the big two. But there are other you know forms of marijuana that are available. You've probably also heard a lot in the literature of the debate over, well, is it, you know, what species is the most potent with THC, which is more the, you know, <coughs> sort of the uh, mind-altering component, the analgesic component, or is it CBD, the cannabidiol, which is the anti-seizure uh, component. And they can be separated out and sourced and, and grown differently. And there's two or three different kinds of species, and it gets to be kind of complicated. There's no quality control. This has not gone through any regular channels. It's not FDA approved for any indication. My personal professional opinion both is that pharmacists should be in the dispensaries. I think there'll be two or three in the area. I, I don't know what the details will be. The state uh, boards of pharmacy, medicine, and um, the legal board are all trying to figure this out, and we are waiting. We are literally waiting uh, for directives from all of those. So. I um, just wanted to let you know that's out there and times are changing. So um, that's all I had. I want to thank you so much for your kind attention. And let me take a drink of water and we can take some questions. Thank you. Thank you. We can also take questions from Kentucky if you want to. Should I speak to that? I'm not sure. If are they still on? I don't know. Maybe they'll sign up. I'm going to sit down. If they're still there, we'll take some questions from them, too. Go ahead, please. Is there a food that has CoQ10 in it? Or is that something you have to get out of the bottle? Man, I haven't been able to find that. I would say that's out of the bottle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Coins so on Q10. With the beans, does it make a difference if they're canned or dried? What kind of beans? Red beans, any kind of beans mm -hmm. you talked about as mm -hmm. red beans. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of articles, including one today, that speaks to statins used for cholesterol reduction, not showing any real improvement in heart disease. What's your thoughts on that? Well, there's probably very few cardiologists in the United States of America that would agree with that, um, because they seem to keep lowering it. But I think it's also important to remember a couple more things about fascinating about cholesterol and that you you know it, how low is too low. That is our magic number. Well, there's a negative feedback loop with cholesterol in the liver. And if you push it down, it's a life-giving constituent of our bodies. It's everywhere. Okay, so it's one of those precursors to all the hormones and all the other, you know, a lot of other um, important compounds, constituents, whatever you want to say in the body. Um, I don't know what to say in terms of the outcome. There have been a lot of studies that have done a good job of demonstrating the utility of statins over you know, 20, 30 years. I heard an amazing story. I don't know if this is true. I haven't cooperated it. But supposedly, President Eisenhower um, started this whole mess in his uh, term in office when he was getting physicals and they were taking blood studies and, and looked at cholesterol and fats in his blood and determined that he needed I guess, medication or whatever, and determined that there was a certain number, and it really wasn't that scientific, that number, and in fact, that's what we use today, which is 200 milligrams of total, and um, typically 100 to 130 of LDL, and typically anything above you know, 40 or 50 plus for LDL, for HDL, and then the ratios and so on. Um, so the point of, of that whole deal is, is it really scientific? Um, you know, I am not a proponent of just going by a number and making chasing that number until it goes to a certain you know, threshold in life. I don't think that's 
a good way to look at the journey. It's a very different perspective than somebody who's a scientist coming and debating a study and it's modeling and you know the outcome. There are a lot of people that would say there have been a lot of studies to show primary and secondary improvement with statins. But that is not to the exclusion of lifestyle and exercise and stress management and all the other dynamics that go into the journey. And those are the things that aren't studied, sir. I can't comment. Maybe they make it make as much of a difference, if not more, than what your cholesterol number is mm -hmm. because of those telomeres. Yeah. Something to think about. So his question I want to know, I also want to know about glucosamine can you Oh, know? sure. Sure, thank you. Um, well, so um, osteoarthritis is something that causes stiffness and um, a reduction in the um, cartilage in joints and pain. So many people say, well, what can I do besides the NSAIDs? You know, that's a kind of a tough category. It obviously has long-reaching effects on the kidney, the stomach, and the heart. So glucosamine is a sugar. It is something that is disease-modifying. It is, um, over time, sometimes uh, successful in building up the cartilage. It can be done through hyaluronic acid or water or, you know, both in the joint. It is a lifetime decision if it works because if you stop, it reverts, but your joint reverts back to the way it was. Um, I don't like the fact that it's combined with chondroitin or with MSM uh, because you won't know which products, if any, is working if you're taking combination products. Um, glucosamine does increase sugar if you're diabetic. The glucosamine hydrochloride is um, one that has sodium in it, I'm sorry, the glucosamine sulfate, rather. Glu glucosamine sulfate is one that has sodium in it, so it increases blood pressure. If that's a concern, you can switch to another format, which is the hydrochloride salt. Um, um, if you're allergic to shellfish, you should not take that because it's sourced typically in shellfish chitin. Um, why don't I like chondroitin? Because it increases risk of bruising and bleeding. All you're doing is adding more water. It really doesn't, uh, what I've read, it isn't that well absorbed orally. Um, MSM is an, anti, an incredibly potent anti-inflammatory, but on muscle, and it's an analgesic. So it tells your brain not to feel the pain. Hmm. So chondroitin alone be the best choice of all that. Yeah, but again, if it's you need to talk over with your doc. I'm not recommending anything for you. Or you know, or... A lot of the yeah. health food stores around they recommend cod liver oil now to the people. Like back in the day when I remember my mother grew up taking cod liver oil. <laughs> so a lot of them like health foods sort of recommend that instead. What do you think? That's they, fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. Is that natural? Is that, sure. It's coming from fish. It's coming from fish. I mean, does that have as much DHA as regular? Like, I don't know the, I don't know the, the difference. You'd have to look in the dose. So you have to read that. They say the only difference is it includes vitamin A naturally. Mm -hmm. Well, you can get too much vitamin A too, and I could go on all night. So cod liver oil is fine. You would follow the recommended dose on the bottle. And you, if you wish to compare, you can see or call the company. Again, they'll be able to give you more details if you press for them. Okay. What's your thought on uh, um, the differences or the comparison between uh, green tea, drinking green tea, I presume, versus a green tea extract? The reason I'm asking because Consumer Reports came out with a list of supplements you should never, ever take a about a month or two ago. The and green tea extract was on the there. Green tree, uh, green tea extract was on that list. Yeah, well, green tea extract is used for weight loss, and it is a, the weight loss category of supplements are highly adulterated, so I'm not surprised. I, I did not read that article, so I'm not sure what it was intended to, to share. Um, there is another part of me that feels obliged to tell you that Mehmet Oz is a big part of the problem. The what? Mehmet Oz oh. is a big part of the problem with weight loss, sensationalism, um, and I think he was actually taken to court over this at some point, but in his television show for the longest time he was promoting different weight loss supplements, and I know that because 
a lot of my clients or people I knew would come and ask me of the supplement du jour or supplement du week, and could I get that or what did I think about it? And it turns out that many of them were not only based just on animal studies or not even such, but that they were um, turning up adulterated with pretty significant things. And I mean, we haven't even talked this evening about, say, say you wanted to do supplements for whatever reason, and you felt strongly, and, and you're welcome to, of course, you know, your opinions. Do you understand that um, we don't have a good way, unless you really put a lot of effort into it, to, to guarantee that you've got a high quality product? Do, do you understand that? How much harder it is well, to guarantee that you got I mean, a high quality product? There is no, product? no regulatory body on the, Yes, there is. Yes, yes there, there is. is. To clarify, they are regulated by the FDA, but they're regulated as foods, not as drugs. Right. I mean, as far as. But the feds can't pull it off the shelf until it does something bad to you. And that's thankfully from the Deche Act, or not, from the Deche Act of 1994. A lot of bad things are something that's because there's no control. They can have uh, things in there that aren't listed. Uh, that's right. Even poison comes That's out. right. That's right. And you know, there are independent companies now that are helping us figure that out, and one of them is ConsumerLab.com. Yeah, that's right, yeah. um, Which is a great, uh, you do have to pay for that service now. I think it's like $30 a year or something, which is $30 well spent if you're interested in that. But you can also look for labels that have USP certified or, you know, like a little round seal of certification. Nature Made happens to be a brand now that's on television quite a bit, but it's not the only one that's out there, and not all their products are USP certified. Um, there are many. So you just have to kind of learn how the, and, and again, I'm more in tune with teaching you guys principles than in recommending any brands or any, you know, combination of products. That's just not my bag. But teaching you how to stay safe and to be skeptical is being safe. And having a pharmacist or a doctor help you select a product is being safe. Every time. Yes? Um, I, one thing somebody said one time, and it just, and he had a hard, I had a hard time getting it out of my head because, you know, you always hear just cholesterol with heart disease, you know, is the main concern. Right? But they were being interviewed, I think, on the radio or whatever, and they were, they were making a really big case for sugar and heart disease. Yeah, too much sugar. Is well, oh, yeah. okay, so refined sugar is, is bad any way you cut it. I, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. That's just nasty stuff. I think that the sugar substitutes are pretty bad too. So you might ask, well, what's left? Well, you know, fruit is sweet. There's sugars in fruit. Um, agave is a low glycemic index, like a syrup, honey substitute. That's sweet. Um, and it kind of mellows out your insulin so you're not doing one of these, you know, all day long. Yeah. Um, refined sugar is just nasty, and I'm not into all, you know, no sugar and you don't have to worry about cancer, or acid-based, you don't have to worry about cancer, or a certain kind of water. I'm not into those extremist thoughts. But does it play a role in heart disease? Does it play a role in heart disease? Anything that translates into more fat is going to play a role in heart disease. Okay. So For more carbohydrates, the sugar and carbon. Started, uh, are you, or do you have a concern for a particular reason, like how much or something? Or? Well, no, I, I just always focus on low fat and, and, and having the good fats, you know, having the good fats in the red drain. And, okay. and then sugar was for a different reason. But he was like trying to make this point that the glycemic, uh, when it's broken down, is an activator for certain problems in the coronary system. Uh, I don't know if I could even speak to that intelligently. I just think that refined sugar is horrible yeah. in general. So, so well, there's, right. there's a lot of other types of sugars in these foods too. A lot of foods are just loaded with sugar or other. Yeah, sucrose, fructose, galactose, mannose. Yeah. Yeah. What's the sugar alcohol? I see that a lot in Kroger on labels. Do you know what that is? No. Probably sugar. Anything with sugar out. Name is hard to pronounce. Probably sugar. <laughs> okay, I'll take just a couple more. Yes, sir. What's your opinion on juicy? Is For your, what reason? Well, general health or? I mean, I juice, and then people say, well, why? And I don't know why. Other than I just do it. 
you enjoy it? Well, one thing for sure is it's a lot easier to get in a lot more fruits and vegetables in a drink that's been pulverized than to try to eat them in whole food bulk. Um, I don't have any problem with it, but be, be advised, with one caveat, be advised that if you're dumping like a bunch of carrots in there, literally a bunch of carrots, you're overdosing on vitamin A. And that's not good. It's probably one of the few exceptions that I... Juicing is kind of in the middle between whole foods and you know the nutrition and the benefit and the perfection of the, the plant kingdom and supplements and drugs, which are like way over there. Juicing is like, I said before, you can't really nuke out on a food. Well, yeah, you can with juicing because you're shoving it all in there. More than you would eat if you were at the table. So just bear that. Carrots have more sugar than other vegetables, too. And most other vegetables have got more sugar. Okay, I have one other, a little quick. Um, I just wrote a book. Uh, I'm just going to put in a shameless plug. Available on Amazon. It's called Don't Sweep It Under the Dry. It's about integrative health and medicine and my father's journey through cancer. Um, Amazon.com. Yes, sir. Since you want to give shameless plugs, why don't you tell us what services you offer in your brochure? Oh, well, um, I do private consultations one on one. I have an office in Blue Ash, not too far from here. Um, you can come and just ask me about your meds and supplements only, or you can talk with about, about those and nutrition and a lot of other things like um, eight balance points, mind, body, spirit. So emotional, social, spiritual, environmental, exercise, nutrition, all of the above. And then I write a written report, you get to keep it. So it's on plant protein based foods as opposed to meat protein. What's my thought on plant-based plant protein? Based, yeah, plant-based protein. <coughs> like meat, plant. Oh, is it like different kinds of protein. Well, there's different amino acids. There's different amino acids, yeah. and you have to kind of concern yourself with that. Is and it that's, more beneficial with plant protein opposed to You can do the same thing. You can do the same, same thing. Okay. okay, guys. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.